Amen. Mm-hmm. 
Good. I'm, I'm glad to see that people know what Buenos Dias is, or, or you're that you're good at repeating. Um, it's it's great to be here. Um, one thing for me, I've I've been in the states for about a um, couple months now, since January, and finding home in different places is always very special for me. Um, many of you have been a part of my journey for several years now, some of you my entire life. Um, 
And so that's really just fun to, to see that God is a good giver of gifts, and gift is relationships. Like, we don't really think of relationships as gifts sometimes, but that is the greatest gift that God gave us in Jesus, and it's also the gift that we give to each other as we walk with each other. So thank you, Grace Bible, for being a part of what you're going to hear this morning, because you are a part of this. Yeah. <laughs> now, we're going to start off this morning with um, an image that several of you may recognize what this is. What is this? A generator. Now, a generator is a device that converts motive power into electrical power for use in an external circuit. So it is used to empower things. And that is what a generator is made to do. That is what a generator is called to do. If it doesn't function as that, it's useless, right? Um, now, trying to get this to, to move. It's not. Maybe. Uh, Yeah, it's not. You always try to be smooth with technology, and and then, and then when it doesn't. This is a weekly occurrence for us here. Can you see the up arrow? It is lost. It happens. We're rebooting here, so it'll take a moment for us to come back up. There. Oh, there we go. Oh, 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 don't jump too far. Okay, empower. That's all right. We're back. <laughs> okay, so one week before March 27, 2017, so almost two years ago, a week before March 27, Stacy and I were at one of our department stores. And we were standing in front of this generator, and we had heard, like, it's been raining for months. I don't know, well, many of you probably remember the news of the floods that we experienced in Peru. So it had been raining for months. We live in the desert. Some of the kids, while I was setting up, asked me if I lived at the place that, on the blanket. I don't live in Machu Picchu. Um, I live in the desert. And so when it rains for months, to a region where we get one to three inches a whole year, when it rains for several months, it's pretty devastating. So we were into March. It had been raining since the end of January. And we were, had we lost power several times. There was rumors that the river was going to overflow, something that had never happened. So everyone was saying, it's not going to happen. And we just felt like, we need to buy a generator. Now, we didn't really know how to run a generator or, you know, use it. <laughs> But just felt like we can learn and we need it kind of thing. Like, we feel like we need it, so we bought it. But little did we know that the Spirit of God was moving in us to buy this generator a week before the river overflowed its banks. March 27 is the day in northern Peru. It is the day that the river of Buda that runs through the middle of our city overflowed into the city, but also south of the city, took over communities and isolated people. Little did we know that the Spirit of God was moving in us to, to make this crazy move of investing in this machine, to be able to have our house become a shelter. Um, so because of this generator, we had power. When the river overflowed, the river came right behind the block of our house. So like, you know, it was creeping, creeping, and then it's coming, it's coming, getting our house ready, and then it just stopped. So our house became a refuge kind of shelter for the people in communities like called Catacaos or Chato Chico or different places where we went and pulled them out, or the Navy pulled them out either by helicopter or by boat, and some of them by walking out. 
but our home became that. Um, and this generator helped us have water because it ran the pump. We don't know how we had water for that, those two weeks, but Jesus can reproduce bread and fish, so I guess he can reproduce water. And we had water, we had electricity. We were able to also release this generator to churches and build over 250 homes. Um, our churches went to the communities and built homes for people that completely lost their homes and had to relocate to higher ground. So little did we know that the Spirit of God was calling us to buy this generator that sits in our garage, in our storage room, and it is our empowering machine, and it sits with us. We still use it. Now this picture is uh, from March 27. The river is to the left. Our house is a block that way, or two blocks that way, sorry. When I saw this image, and this kind of image I saw a lot um, during those days, there was a lot of people helping each other. Um, people feeling the need to help their neighbor, no matter who they were, whether they liked them or not, whether, you know, how it is sometimes with neighbors. Um, extending the hand in front of you to grab someone, and then extending their other hand and pulling others with them. Now here there's a rope, so in the center there, there's people holding onto a rope, because with the current of this river, um, it took a lot of people. One kid from our kids' club lost his older brother um, to that in Catacaos. And so it was a very powerful current in some areas, and so there was a lot of that hand action. And when I saw this, this particular picture, I sensed Jesus tell me, this is what I've called you to in Peru. Take my hand in front of you and extend your other hand and bring others with you. That's what discipleship is. So you take Jesus' hands, but you don't just stay with Jesus and say, we're cool, I like you, it's good to go to church, I like going, I like what you give me, I like the freedom, I like heaven. But really, Jesus calls us to so much more. He modeled it by extending his arm out for others. And that's something, something that we came up with um, at missionary training for the kids. Our friends that were missionaries had kids, and they're like, how do we explain it to our kids? We're going to Panama as missionaries. What we're going to go do in Panama? Like, why are we moving from Canada? And that was the, the image or the analogy that my friend Sarah came up with of extending your hand out to Jesus and then extending your other arm out and then teaching them to extend their hand, their arm out for the next person and then them teach. And that is what discipleship is. Now, some of you may recognize, maybe, three years ago I brought this picture up on the screen. Uh, when I moved to Peru, uh, I was leaving a lot of things, as many of you know. When you leave a place, you, you leave things behind. One of the things I was moving away from was family. Um, but particularly, one thing I was walking through was the loss of our cousin Erica, um, who had cancer for a few years, and a few, a cup, one month before missionary training, she passed away. Now, this was the most, for me personally, um, difficult loss. She was 30 years old, had a five and a four year old, and we prayed a lot, um, but her healing was heavenly. Um, but it left me with this sense of, ah, <laughs> like, just a lot of pain. So that was hard. But I knew God was calling me to Peru. I knew that my grandma, Lupita, um, was also very affirming in me going. Some of you may remember part of my story three years ago um, as I was going out was the legacy that she, 
she would share about the missionaries that came to us in South Texas, and because of them, um, we know Jesus. So for me, that was very influential. Um, six months after I arrived in Peru, she passed away. Um, that was hard. And that was another, like, ah, like, this is hard. Um, just loss. And... And valley, like really, that's what it started feeling like. It started to feel like a dark valley of shadow of death. Have you ever felt like that before, Psalm 23? That's what it felt like. Um, in the meantime, you know, being in Peru, you're adjusting to a new life. Your health, some of you may remember that too. My health was also up and down um, with asthma and allergies and um, stomach. Because, you know, when you move to a new place, your stomach just does things as well. Um, but also, in the midst of Erica's passing, my grandma's passing, my own health, we then had El Nino start hitting us. It was three months after grandma passed. Um, this reality then came, and it was loss after loss after loss. And this was like, people are losing their homes, people don't have enough food, so it was months of like, Okay, let's get food baskets together. Okay, let's get this together. Okay, we've got more funds coming in. Okay, let's do this. And there's loss over here. If every one of you here are in need of something, but you have enough funds for like this, like how do you tell the rest of them, sorry? Or, or how do you discern like how much do you give who and who do you give first? And is there more or less? Or, so it was this reality of there's everyone is at loss of something, so how do we walk through this? This picture shows kind of what it felt like. So Stacy's car, I'm actually in the back of a similar truck like this one off to the right um, with, it was the lid thing was down. I don't know what you, whatever it's called around here. Um, <laughs> But Stacy is in there, and we are going to communities. Um, this was the reality, people now living on the side of the road um, and relief coming in and out of places. And the river was off um, towards the end of the picture. There's the river, and um, chaos is really what I'm trying to show here in this picture. It was just like just everyone going here, everyone going there. It was, it was chaos. It was lost reality of, of this loss was, was not just like a boom, you lost it. It was like lost here, lost there, lost here, lost there, lost there. And then we also had two young people in our church pass away, uh, both from cancer, and that was hard. Um, but little did I know, you're going to hear that phrase a bit, but little did I know but the spirit of God within me was empowering hope. In Romans 5, 3 through 4, we read Paul say, Sufferings produce endurance, and endurance character. And then proven character produces hope. So hope doesn't get produced without the stuff before it. So if you don't have sufferings and hard stuff, then endurance doesn't get produced. And if endurance doesn't get produced, then you can't produce character. And then if you don't have character, you can't have hope in that Jesus, in that salvation. So really, as humans... We run away from sufferings, and we don't like it. We don't like to cry. We, we apologize for it. We, we say we shouldn't. But Jesus models for us that it's okay to cry. And actually, you, when you go through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil because I am with you. So not... If, for some reason in your life, you go through some valley in the shadow of death, if you do, remember that I'm with you. It's saying when you do, whatever it looks like, it all 
looks different for everyone. When you go through that valley, I am with you. So this hope, this is the empowering hope. And he's been strengthening that. This next picture is a moment, a few days after the river overflowed, the waters had um, gone down in most places. We went in to see homes that had been collapsed and, and our kids' club, seeing if our kids were okay and seeing people from the churches, if they were fine and what they needed. And we were walking through sewer filled because everything collapsed, like sewer lines, everything was just, you know, it just all becomes one. So let's just say it was pretty smelly. And as we were walking, and our shoes are fairly clean right now, they got pretty dirty later. Um, they are at the bottom, crusty, with, well, I'll spare you the details. Um, but as we were walking, I sensed the spirit say, take your phone out and take a picture. Now I thought, no, if my phone falls, that's gross. If it falls right there, like, that's like, Mm, questionable, I don't want to then have my phone later, and I like my phone. Um, no, take your camera, take your phone out and take a picture. I, I need you to remember this moment. So I took this picture as we're walking, and I remember Jesus telling me, Joanna, it is my good news, but it is your feet that have to go. It is my good news. I am the good news but your feet have to go. Even if the waters are going to be smelly, even if it's going to be hard, even if it's not what you thought it was going to be, your feet have to go. But remember, it's not your good news, it's mine. I am the good news. In Isaiah 52, seven, how beautiful are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation. So it is not Joanna and Stacy, my teammate. It's not our good news. It's not the Mennonite brethren. It's not us as missionaries. It's not the church even that's the good news. It's Jesus. He's he alone is the good news, but it's our feet that are called to go and be a part of taking his good news, taking him to be the good news around the world. Now, I don't know about you, but compacting three years into a few minutes is a bit challenging. So around September, October, November, I was like, I'd already made connections with Pastor Scott and all the other churches. All right, things are lining up. And then I'm like, what am I gonna share? <laughs> like, how do you know what to share? I don't have the hundreds of people came to Jesus and hundreds were baptized and I don't have the, the glory missionary stories. So Satan was really trying to attack me on that. You know, you're not a good enough missionary side of things. He likes to do that. Um, you, you stay over there and be quiet. You, you haven't done a good enough job. And then, you know, I was on Facebook because that's where all truth is. <laughs> um, that's a lie. Don't, that's not. So it was a joke. <laughs> but I was on there and I saw this quote. Measure your fruitfulness through the fruit of those you empower instead of through your personal, your own personal fruit. When I read that, it was like, the Spirit of God was like, that's it. Empoderar, empower. That, that word just popped out. And it was like, this is it. Jesus has called me to be a generator for people. Jesus has called me to empower other people. And then the generator came to mind as Stacy was like, you should talk about the generator. And then things just started lining up. So really, the generator empowers things, 
And Jesus has called me, but you too, to be a generator for people, to empower them, to follow Jesus, to take the hand of Jesus, and then extend their arm out for others to follow through. Now, many of you may be asking, so you just, uh, you responded to floods for the past three years. What else do you do in Peru? <laughs> um, so a lot of what I do is, um, is I walk with people. Um, discipleship is walking. One of the main things that I do is this thing called Casa Caminata. Casa means ha, kids. You remember? House. house. There you go. We were outside learning what Casa Caminata meant. Casa means house. Caminata means, Brianna, do you know? I didn't remember. Sorry, walking. Yeah, like walking. Um, so a long walk is what we like to use it as. A long walk or on a journey. So a house that journeys and walks together. So depicting what Jesus calls us to. That discipleship is not just a Bible study hour on Saturday from 7 to 8.30. Discipleship is actually your life, like everything you do, how you choose to respond to things, how you choose to not respond to things, how you live your life is discipleship of someone. Now, whether it's Jesus or not, that's, that's where it changes. What we do at Casa Caminata, Stacy and I open up our home, so it's a 24-7 job. Um, and for a year, Peruvian young ladies from the churches are recommended from the pastors to come live with us, and we walk with them. They each come with their story. They each come with their ways of living, their, their knowings of how to cook, of how to clean, of how not to cook, of how not to clean. And so we walk with them. They learn how to cook Mexican food, and they learn how to cook American food. Um, they learn how to ask for forgiveness when they responded with a little attitude because they were tired or they were fed up with the attitude of so-and-so, and, well, let's reconcile that because we are not called to be the way we just were, were we? Um, so just walking through what does a disciple of Jesus look like, and helping them see that modeled out. Because um, a lot of them come from, the, they're the only Christians in their home. They're either first generation or second generation, and things are still being transformed. Even if their parents are believers, there are th things that still need to be transformed in them. Um, majority of our churches, most of the people are have been Christians for 30 years or less. Um, most of them actually probably 15 years or less. We have a few that are, um, have been walking with Jesus for a little bit longer, but majority of them, it's only been a few years. So it's transformation of life um, for them and walking with us, walking with their families as well. So this picture that's up here is a picture of Stacy on the right, Ruth, is next to Stacy and Ruth's little brother, Alonso, is standing with her. Rosalie, our Peruvian best friend, <laughs> is right there in the middle with her Tabor Proud shirt that I gave her in 2014 that she never takes off, so it's pretty thin. Um, well, she does take it off, but she does wash it. Um, myself, and Perla next to me, and Cassandra is down to the right. Those are girls that have gone through Casa Caminata, um, either the first time around when Stacy did it on her own, or this last um, year that Stacy and I had a second group. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about Ruth and Perla. We walk with people like Ruth and Perla, I'm going to give you a glimpse into what it was like to walk with them. Ruth, her dad was an alcoholic before coming to Jesus, abusive, all around abusive father. Um, so she came with a lot of trauma. Um, her dad, following Jesus, is a leader. He's actually a leader of one of the church plants. Um, both her parents um, love Jesus. They actually just had their sixth baby, so 
happy I get to go meet baby number six. Um, but Ruth also lost her house completely with El Nino in 2017. Her town became an island. She was isolated and took care of her other four siblings on top of the hill, and then the rest of it was surrounded by water. Her dad, prior to the river coming and taking over, her dad had gone to, to see if there was higher ground land somewhere else. Um, so when the river all of a sudden surrounded them, um, her mom was panicking. The helicopter came to see if anyone wanted to be rescued out of there. She went and went to go look for him. So a week and a half, Ruth took care of her siblings by herself, not knowing if her parents were okay and where they were. Um, so she lived with a lot of trauma. Then she moved in. That happened in March. So then that in June, beginning of June, she moved in with us. And at the same time, Perla moved in with us. So they moved in in June. August 5th, Perla gets a phone call at her boyfriend of six years. Um, Perla's a 29-year-old. She just turned 29. Her boyfriend of six years um, couldn't breathe. He was very short of breath. He was in the emergency room. And so she's like, well, what's wrong? And, you know, well, yeah, I've been, you know, short of breath lately. He was a heavier set guy. Oh, it's because he's fat, like, in Peru. They'll just tell you. <laughs> it's because you're fat. Oh, oh, thank you. So nice of you. Um, um, oh, he has asthma. Oh, he has this. Since April, they had been telling that. In April, he got dengue. With El Nino, we got a lot of mosquito-borne illnesses. Dengue is one of them where it attacks in different ways. And one of the things that affected him was apparently a melon-sized tumor that was between his heart and lung that was cancerous. And he never knew he had that tumor. The doctors say he probably had it since he was a little boy. When he got dengue, the tumor just went a lot more active. So then the cancer started uh, being more aggressive I don't know why and how, but that was what the doctor said. And then August 7th, so a day and a half later, he passed away. Let me tell you, watching this unfold was traumatic for all of us. Not only losing Andre because he had just started coming to church. Like, he was a genuinely awesome guy. Like, God was really doing some good stuff in him, and he was starting to play guitar. He had come to my birthday party. He was being discipled by our pastor. He was just wanting more. And August 7th came, or 9th, I think. Um, when he passed away, Perla was left with a lot of questions. And what was interesting for me was she was left with a lot of questions that I had about when Erica passed. Just real raw questions like, God, why do you heal these people? But you didn't heal. Like, this person doesn't even care about their life. Like, you brought them out of cancer. And like, I have a cousin who, on my dad's side, who has had leukemia and is just a drug addict. And, like, you, she's lost her kids and she's still alive and doesn't really care about life. And I love her, but. Erica loved life and loved her kids, was on fire, was wanting to really turn life around for her family. And, and you just, I just don't get it. Like, why? How do you work? <laughs> How? And so I was left with a lot of real raw questions. What I was learning to do was go to Jesus. What I did a lot of with Perla, specifically, was cry. So a lot of the discipleship that I did, and Stacy and the rest of the girls, the discipleship we did with Perla was really teaching her to go to Jesus with real life. That Jesus can handle your questions. Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? If you can take this cup from me, but your will be done. So Jesus had his moments with his father of just like, I don't like that. Like, I'm not looking forward to that. I, I, don't, I don't want that. But your will be done. But I trust you. When you pass through the valley of shadow of death, I will be with you. That is the promise. Not that I'll protect you 
from not walking through the valley, but I will be with you. That is his promise. So a lot of days, Perla would walk into my room. She just, I could just see her face, and I just nod at her. And she'd lay down on my bed and peruse a lot touchier of a culture. So, you know, just sit there and just rub her back or give her a roll of toilet paper because I knew it was coming and just say, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm not going to give you the, the answers that, you know, to like make you stop crying or make you not feel what you're feeling, but let's go to Jesus. And that's what I always told her. Let's go to Jesus. Let him hold you. Let him give you the answers. I, I want to do that for you because Jesus was teaching me and molding me to do that for myself. Um, so the valley that I was walking through, I was then all of a sudden accompanied by people like Perla. And let me tell you, when you walk through the valley with people, God solidifies something in the relationships. So when people ask me, do you feel like God's calling you still to Peru? <laughs> let me tell you, when you go through the valley with people, you really learn how to appreciate and love the community around you that has walked with you through that valley and the same that you have been for them. What's amazing is that the year they lived with us, I'm gonna be honest with you, we were like, did we do anything? <laughs> like, there was no visible fruit. Ruth was this like stoic, just traumatized anytime a question was asked or we did Bible study or we delve into a discussion of something or some, it was just like emotionless, like there were no emotions there. Um, or just like, blah, like words, like they were the right answers, but it was just, it was kind of dead words feeling. Um, and Perla, she, the whole year literally was with questions. And she couldn't find a job. Also, she tried, 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 found a job. She lost her job in December, so boyfriend died in August. December, she lost her job. And then could not find a job all the way till September. So January through September was like, God, like you, you took away my boyfriend, you took away my job. Like, what are you doing? Why are you allowing this? And literally the whole year, okay, God, you called us to do Casa Caminata but I don't know what you did. <laughs> well, let me tell you that it's funny that you forget how big God is and that he's, it's the unseen reality of what he's doing. Perla moved out in September from her house last year. Around October, she came to me and said, Joanna, I'm thinking of going uh, to Guadalajara, Mexico which I knew what that meant. It was to go to the ADIME six-month discipleship program that our missionary friends have there. It's an intensive, like, it's classes. It's like diving into more class structure. It's a formal kind of discipleship program, more so than ours. It's informal. And um, I looked at her and said, in my mind, I'm like, you still want to follow Jesus. That's good. And this sense of, I feel like I want to hear God's voice. I haven't been able to hear God's voice. I want to hear God's voice. I want, I want to draw near to God. It's been hard to draw near to God because I feel he doesn't hear me or I feel this or I feel that, but I want to. I talked to her two weeks ago for two hours on the phone and let me tell you, I was in tears because of what Jesus is doing in her, healing wounds. And what she was telling me was, Joanna, we went to this, this town, and there were these three older ladies, and I just felt like God was telling me, go, go approach them and ask them how you can pray for them. And so she did. She's like, and as I was, as I was praying for each one of them individually, God gave me a picture or a word or, or something specific, and when I shared it with them, they were just like, 
amazed, like, how did you know that? Or like, that was like right on with what I'm struggling with. Or she's like, it's like God speaks to me through pictures and words like that he just puts in my mind. And there are four people. I'm like, Perla, God talks to you. And she's like, I know, isn't that awesome? And I'm, she's like, are you crying? And I'm like, um, yeah, I'm crying. She's like, oh, and she's like, I didn't want you to cry. It's like, I'm not crying because I'm sad. I'm crying because this is amazing. Jesus is healing you. Jesus is restoring you. Jesus is reminding you of who he really is. And you're ridding yourself of those lies that the enemy was trying to put in your mind of who he was, of who you were, of who this world is. Like, you're finding the truth for yourself. So Perla's in, Me in Mexico, in Mexico, um, till July. Be praying for Perla. Because she's learning stuff that I know she's going to come to in Peru and she's going to advance the kingdom way more than I am. And that's what God's called me to, to empower people like Perla. And Ruth, she messed up right before I came in December. She made really, I won't say the S word, but a really dumb decision. Um, really, really painful decision for her and her family. But she was then knocked in the face of like, I gotta get my life together. She had been lying to us about some things and it was really painful. So when you walk with people in discipleship, you think they're moving forward, we're taking 10 steps forward, and then all of a sudden, how did we just take 100 steps back? And it's, it was really painful to get on the plane to come to the States, knowing that, that Ruth had just made this really dumb decision. But she woke up, her family walked with her, loved her, is discipling, walking with her in a new way. And Stacy is weekly walking through a Bible study is like a book study that is pointing directly at what she needed. Like, it's just right on with some of the truths of who God is and who she is and the lies and how to be able to identify and say, no more, no more lies. I'm not going to live with those lies anymore. And so it's been really fun to hear over the phone from Stacy of what Ruth is journeying through and to hear from afar what Perla is going through. So it's really this amazing thing and also a bit hard to not be there and walking with them. But um, God has been empowering hope and been empowering people um, for us, through us in Peru. And it's been pretty awesome. One of the things I get to do is walk with leaders of our churches. I won't dive into this, but be praying for them. Our pastors and leaders are getting together with Stacy every other week to do a book study, and it is doing really good things of what the Spirit of God has been wanting to do, but the enemy has, has been throwing a lot at them. Um, so we'll be praying for our, our, our conference leadership team, but also our churches as they're learning to walk and really work together, not just say, Dios te bendiga, God bless you, at the meetings, um, conference meetings, but to really work together. Um, God is doing that. These are the faces, Grace Bible. You don't know their stories. You don't know their names, but let me tell you, each one of those are people that I get to walk with and empower hope in them. And it's because of communities and people like you that empower me to be there um, and allow Jesus to then flow out of me for their, their growth and their empowerment. So, 
Thank you for supporting me financially, but in prayer and for being a church and also individuals that walk with me in that way. Because you don't walk with me alone. Um, there's a lot of people that go with me. And the reality is, is, is it's God's good news, like I said. It's his kingdom movement, and it's our feet that are going. Um, it's, it's what he's doing in us and through us. So look at these faces. These are the faces of your brothers and sisters in Peru. These are people that Alan, Antonio, Belen, Elvis, Gisela, Rosita, Mario, Sixto, Luigi, Saul, Emilio, and then Casa Caminata there. These are the names and the faces of people that God is using to, to bring his kingdom in Peru, and I get to empower them and coach them and mentor them and love them as they do the same for me because they have a lot to give as well. They've taught me. Um, and I want to say also that I have a new face in the back. Um, well, same face, but new card. Um, and so if each of you um, would take one, that would be great. Um, and there's a, a few, couple things different in the card as well. And um, one of the things is the Casa Caminata highlight um, that is, I'm a lot more connected with. There's also these, which if each family would take one, it also gives information um, and the faces. It's just easier to pray when there's faces, at least for me. Um, so it encourage you to pray for what God's doing in Casa Caminata, but also the conference, because this is really a hope of a, a culture of discipleship. Not that the house needs to be reproduced, but just the discipleship, like walking with Jesus. This is what we're for. And I do want to say that in the back, we have these witness magazines. Some of you get these. You get the Christian leader, for those of you, most of you. Every other Christian leader, I believe, the witness is in there, if I remember correctly. If not, there's some of these back there. I don't want to take them with me. A, I don't want to pay for more bags when I have to fly. Um, but also, there's stories in here. Every time you get one, read these stories and know that this is what you get to be a part of. This is a part of your family out there. And what God's doing, what's really cool is this is from Peru. So this is Roseli, our Peruvian best friend. And Stephanie, it's her birthday today. Um, and so if you do have young people that want to go on short-term mission, you also know that's part of what I did. So you can talk to me about that. But take this as well. Um, there's a few back there, not as many. And when I was standing out there, I saw this on your little display thing. And this is a herald from our brothers and sisters up north from Canada. And again, it was just, I was flipping through it because I don't get to see this in Peru. And it's just a reminder for you. You're a part of something way bigger than Gettysburg. Like, honestly, God is way larger than, than my life in Peru. And I, I forget that sometimes. So it's this reminder that makes me write refreshment. I, it is way bigger than me. It is way bigger than our, our MB family. The kingdom of God is way bigger. Um, and I also want to encourage you, this little orange book, just pull it out of my hands or if someone's not using it. What I'm doing with this is I'm asking all the churches um, wherever I'm going, if they want to write in here an encouragement for me, or for Peru, or for Stacy, a verse, um, a prayer, whatever, a picture, whatever God gave you. I have things in here from South Texas, I have things in here from Oklahoma, from Kansas, and I even have my, my cousin Mariah in here. In case you didn't know, Brianna's my cousin. Um, so we 
have, um, yeah, my cousin Mariah Gutierrez is right here. She's a cousin who has Down syndrome. So this for me, honestly, like is like, oh, Mariah, like she wrote in the book. But honestly, a year from now, when I look back on here, this is, It's a good reminder. It's a good reminder that I'm not alone. Because I know that here, but um, it's easy to forget that. So if Jesus does um, put something in your heart, to your mind to write in here, um, I'd appreciate that. And no, Grace Bible, that, again, I can't say it enough, you are a part of the story of what God's doing in Peru. Know that I have that on my heart a lot, um, and I appreciate you. And um, my hope is that you may be a church that continues to empower hope here whatever it looks like, that you may continue to take the hand of Jesus with one hand and bring others with you with the other. Because it's not just in Peru that this happens, and it's not just in Thailand or India or over there. We're all called to be missionaries, because missionary means a sent one. Someone sent on a mission. And if you call yourself a Jesus follower, you're not off the hook. Everyone's a missionary. Everyone's called to be on mission. Everyone's called to take the hand of Jesus with one hand and extend the hand and then teach them to extend their hand. So thank you, Grace Bible, for being, being who you are, being a part of the team. And like I said, Take stuff that's back there. I don't want to take it with me. <laughs> so take stuff and just, you don't even have to ask me. Just pull it out of my hand. Um, so thank you. And God bless you. <laughs>